Hello and welcome to the Bright Network webinar all about vacation schemes and commercial law. Thank you so much for joining us today, we're really excited to have you on board. So we've had a lot of demand from our members asking about more information about how to apply for vacation schemes, top tips, advice, so we're bringing you today a really exciting webinar all about these vacation schemes and as you can see I've got a very exceptional panel with me today who will be answering all of your questions towards the end of the session so please do send them in um, and equally sharing some of their experience with you. So this can be a real deep dive into vacation schemes and hopefully you'll come away with some fantastic advice and tips. So our speakers in the middle we've got Manesh Tanner who's an associate at Simmons and Simmons. Next to me Farisha Khan who's currently studying at SOAS and has been through two vacation schemes already. And on the end, we've got Jonathan Andrews, who's studying English at King's, and who completed a winter vacation scheme at Hogan Lovells. So in terms of how we're going to structure this webinar, we'll spend the first 15 minutes having a chat with Manesh, um, and he's going to talk through his professional experience to date, and then give you his top five tips um, on how to successfully apply to a vacation scheme. We'll then spend 10 minutes chatting with Farisha and Jonathan, um, where they'll tell you about their experiences during their vacation schemes and how they think you can do your best to apply for a vacation scheme yourself. And then we'll go to a Q&A. So we've already received loads of questions from you guys. Thank you so much. But please send in questions throughout the session. So I've got my little tablet and we'll be running through those. Um, we have been inundated though, so if we don't get through everything, I do apologise. But we'll do our best to get through as many as possible. So let's dive straight in. Minesh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. We would love to hear about your experiences um, in your in your career and about your time of vacation scheme. So I hand over to you. No problem at all. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll spend a few minutes just telling you a bit about my journey and how I came to be where I am now, which is a, an associate at Simmons and Simmons. Um, and then after five minutes or so, I'll jump into uh, sort of the main event of the day, which is talking about um, my top tips for you getting vacation schemes uh, and then moving on beyond that to training contracts, uh, which is, of course, something that, that I went through, although it seems a long time ago now. Um, so just just give you a background about where I've come from. Um, I uh, graduated in 2009, um, but before that, I spent four years at Oxford studying law. Um, and I started applying for VAC schemes in my second year, as a lot of you are probably thinking about doing at the moment. Um, and I actually tried VAC schemes at, at various law firms across the country and, and a different range of law firms. And I'll come on to talk about why that might be potentially quite important for you guys when looking around uh, at your p potential careers in the law. Um, so, and this is going to tell you how, how old I am and, and how long ago this was, I actually did uh, three VAC schemes in the north of England uh, at firms called Pannoni, Cobbetts and Walker Morris and actually only one of those still remains. Uh, Cobbetts actually went under in the recession so that no longer exists uh, and for those of you who have heard of Pannoni you might know that that's now part of Slater and Gordon which is the, uh, the giant Australian ambulance chasing firm um, and I also did one at Walker Morris in Leeds. Uh, and, and the reason I did that is because I wanted to try out what it would be like to work at various different uh, firms a across the country and with, with a different sort of style and ethos. Um, and, and in that regard, I also did some in London as well. So I did fact schemes at Herbert Smith Freehills, or Herbert Smith as it was then, again, showing how old I am, um, and also at Ashurst. And then I had a bit of a, a sort of a turn of events, which was uh, a year in Paris uh, as part of my degree. Uh, and I decided that I wanted to work a bit when I was in Paris. So I, uh, I jumped at the chance of paralegaling at Herbert Smith in Paris. Uh, and that was what set me up for eventually a training contract at Herbert Smith, which I undertook in London. Uh, and that obviously took up my two years. I had a very interesting training contract there, uh, including one seat, my full seat in the Middle East in Abu Dhabi. Uh, and actually that's where I qualified as a solicitor out in the Middle East. So I qualified with Herbert Smith in Dubai. I then stayed with Herbert Smith in Dubai for a while and then made the transition over to Simmons and Simmons in Dubai. Uh, and I spent two and a half years in Dubai with Simmons and Simmons. And then I moved back to London about a year ago, uh, and I'm a mid-level associate at Simmons in the dispute resolution team. So that's a very whistle-stop tour throughout my career, um, and feel free to ask me any questions later on about my journey. Uh, and I think I'll just move on now to talking a bit about vacation schemes uh, and applying and my five top tips. So I guess you all know what a vacation scheme is uh, in broad terms, but effectively it's the period between one and three weeks where you can get to 
try out what it's like to be a solicitor in a law firm uh, and increasingly now law firms get the chance to look at you and judge you and assess you uh, and hopefully take you on for a training contract at the end of the vacation scheme. Um, now vacation schemes are becoming more and more important and uh, I'll come on to my experiences later on but most relevant for you guys is that I'm actually interviewing a lot for vacation scheme candidates so uh, I'm happy to give you any potentially not inside knowledge, but at least some knowledge later on on what we're looking for uh, in the candidates that, that we're looking at. But as I said, most importantly is that law firms increasingly are now recruiting directly from their vacation schemes. So they're becoming more and more important. And a lot of you will find that the application process for a vacation scheme is exactly the same as it is for a training contract. So I want to just run through five top tips uh, that I would say are most important for you in succeeding at obtaining a vacation scheme and potentially converting that into a training contract later on. I think the first top tip is preparation and early preparation. Now I think a lot of you will be either in your uh, second year or potentially in your third year if you're doing a four year degree at university. Um, now I am all for saying that you should try and enjoy your lives before you jump straight into a career. But that said, it's quite important that you do start thinking about your training contract and your future career in the law as early on as possible. Um, as later on it does get more competitive, you're then facing competition from people who are younger than you. Uh, and also you're in the sort of peak of your uh, application process as it were. You're, you're doing your degrees and uh, you will be in the zone as it were for, for applying for these places. Um, so try and get started really early on. And that doesn't mean you've just got to dive in and, and start your first application form. I think the key really is getting to know where you want to go, what type of firms you're looking for, uh, and, and really getting to know those firms. And I'll come on to talking a bit about that in the course of my next few tips. Now, tip number two uh, is being ambitious, but also being realistic. Um, now, all of you will want to work at, at the best firms possible, and that's absolutely a, a fair goal to be going for. Be absolutely ambitious, but also um, I think it's a very good time to sort of take a look in the mirror uh, and assess your own strengths and weaknesses uh, and also decide what type of law firm is going to be best for you uh, and what type of law firm you're capable of getting to. Now, the sad reality is um, there aren't enough places at all the Magic Circle firms for all of you. Some of you will get there, some of you may not. But the important thing is some of you may not, may not want to get there or, or may not apply for those places. So it's very important to take a step back at this stage uh, and start to look at your own strengths and weaknesses, your own personality, uh, and really have a good go at assessing where your skills lie and how appropriate that is going to be for certain law firms. Um, I started with a spreadsheet. Uh, I literally just opened up Excel uh, and started putting in the names of some law firms and then started populating various rows and columns with um, aspects of those law firms that I could gain from publicly available sources. Uh, and then I sort of stood back and thought, well, which of these law firms do I think I'm going to be suited to? And you, look, you can look at a, a range of characteristics, really. Um, where would you like to work in the future? The great thing about the careers that you're going for are that you're going to join international law firms. If you have a particular desire to go and work in America at some point, then maybe you want to start thinking about American law firms. If you want to stay nationally and potentially work in other cities within the country, then you should be looking at a, a more regional firm or a national firm, which allows you to do that. And getting started on this process very early on will really help you along the way. Uh, if only to eliminate some of those law firms that, that you're not interested in because they don't suit uh, the characteristics that you're looking for. So my tip is to start really early on. Uh, the worst thing possible is sending that application in at five to midnight on the deadline day uh, and realizing later on that you could have done X, Y, and Z to improve that application. So get started early on. Now, my third tip is coming back to what I said about the firms that, that I worked at uh, and the firms that I took a VAC scheme at is try different types of firms because um, I think as you'll come on to hear later on there are lots of different types of firms and spending time at them in the course of a VAC scheme is really one of the best ways of getting to know them. Um, you can go to all sorts of law fairs and, and events at university and meet people from the, the law firms, but the best way possible of getting to know these firms is to spend a few weeks with them, which a VAC scheme enables you to do. Now, there are various ways in which a firm can be uh, distinguished from other firms. One of the biggest is, is the personality of the firm and the ethos. The reason why I enjoy my job at the moment so much at Simmons & Simmons is because uh, it's, it's a firm full of wonderful personalities, um, people who are not afraid to be themselves at work, uh, and I really like that about it. We have a, a really good camaraderie with all, all of our colleagues, and it's a great place to work. Um, 
for some people, they might not want that. They might want a, a quieter firm um, somewhere where they can um, tuck themselves away and get on with work. Or yeah, there's a range of different personalities from law firm to law firm, and uh, it's a good way of testing which law firm you're going to be suited to um, to try uh, try as many vaccines as you can. Now, as I said, I tried some VAC schemes in firms in Manchester and, and Leeds. Uh, and of course, you know, there are lots of good firms up, up there. And it's not to say that you have to join um, the top London firms internationally in order to have the best possible training contract and to set you in the best possible stead going forward. Some of you may prefer to go to a slightly smaller firm or a firm that specialises in certain type of work. Uh, and often the best way of actually knowing what type of firm you're looking for is to go and try a few different types. So don't be afraid to say, well, I'm going to try a couple of applications to Magic Circle firms. I'm going to try perhaps one to an American firm to see what that's, that's like. Uh, and then perhaps one or two to a slightly smaller firm or a regional firm. For me, going to those regional firms made it clear to me that I wanted to be in London and doing my training contract there. But very importantly, I had to go and test out that theory. I had to go to those firms in the north where I had a, an absolutely wonderful time. But for me, it confirmed that I wanted to start my career in London. Um, so my tip for you, number three, is to try as many different firms as you can. Moving on, I think um, my fourth tip uh, is going to be do your homework. And I think this is actually something that I can't uh, overestimate enough. And it comes out of the fact that I'm currently interviewing a lot. Uh, for vacation scheme candidates and training contract candidates and it is abundantly clear in all cases where candidates haven't done their homework. Now it's a cliche to say you should get to know as much as you can about the firm and I see candidates a lot of the time quote stats from, from Simmons or just giving me other slices of information from the firm but it's rare that I really get a candidate who's actually taken the time to read lots of information about the firm and really got to grips with what the firm is about what sectors it specialises in, the type of work that it does, uh, and where it sees itself going in the future. Um, it's very obvious where a candidate has just spent 10 minutes on the website, for example, and is churning out the odd fact here and there uh, in order to try and convince me that they've read about the firm. Actually, what you need to do is spend a, a lot of time, and I appreciate when you're applying to many different law firms, it's not easy to do, but there's no point in making 20 applications where you've only skirted around each of those 20 law firms. It's far better to do fewer applications uh, and really get to know the firms that you're applying to. So yes, go on the website, but really have a look through everything that the firm stands for uh, and go through third party news sources as well, because they will report things in a different light. They may tell you things that the firm's website won't tell you. Uh, and all in all, it will just give you a better picture uh, of what that law firm is about. And then when it comes to the application process, really bring out that knowledge. And it doesn't mean just putting tidbits of facts here and there into your application form. Don't sprinkle your application process with facts about the firm. Really get to know the firm and, and have a discussion about it in your application. Uh, and don't be afraid to challenge certain views of the firm or decisions that the firm's made. It just shows that you're engaged in the application process and you're really getting to know the firm that you're applying to. Um, and actually, after the five tips that, that I'm going to give you today, the three that I've given you so far, I think by far this is the most important and it's the one that really separates good candidates from weak candidates in what I'm seeing so far uh, in the application process. The better you know the firm, the more it shows to us that you actually care, that you want to apply to us uh, and that you're deserving of a place. And uh, I think finally, uh, my tip number five for you um, is to treat the VAC scheme application like a training contract application. As I said at the start, vacation schemes are now becoming almost the sole way in which law firms are recruiting training contracts candidates now, um, and that's hardly a surprise. I mean, I supervise VAC schemers all the time, and we get two or three weeks assessing a candidate. It is far better than looking at an application form and a few interviews. That does tell us quite a lot uh, about you, but there's nothing compared to three weeks in an office, putting you through your paces and getting to know you as a person. Um, and that's the best way that we're, we're recruiting candidates now. So it's all the more important that you put as much work as you can into these vaccine applications, uh, get to the firms, and now that's proving to be a very useful way into your training contracts. So treat these applications as if they, they were your training contract applications. So those are my five tips. Um, I'm more than happy to take any questions later on, um, but I think you're going to hear more, let's say, contemporaneous and, and recent uh, tips from people who have just gone through the process.
Thank you so much, Manesh, for your top tips with us and your experience. So as Manesh said, please send in your questions. We'll be asking our panel for about 30 minutes after you've spoken to Farisha and Jonathan. So do get them sent in. Um, and we'll now be moving on to the more contemporary <laughs> uh, members of our panel. So Farisha and Jonathan, thank you so much for coming in to see us today. Uh, so first of all, we want to know, how did you find your spring vacation? So Farisha, you had two schemes that you did. Tell us about those. How did you find the experience? You know, what did you learn from them? Thank you, Chloe. Um, so I did two spring vacation schemes, and I think uh, the most important thing that I learned is uh, how to, how does a law firm operate? So who are law firms' clients? What different departments are involved in making a single deal work? And I think I also understood uh, the difference between um, you know, a corporate culture versus coming straight out of university. So I think it relaxed me a lot more. Uh, I think I, under I understood that pe it gave me an idea of what the law firm's culture is like, how I will get on if I choose to do my training contract at those firms. Um, so yeah, those were my sort of top lessons I learned. Thank you. And Jonathan, you did a winter vacation scheme at Hogan Lovells. Yeah. What did you learn from that experience? Um, well, firstly, it really helped to be in an office environment to learn about how lawyers actually work to make the law happen rather than just thinking about law. So I didn't actually do a law um, undergraduate degree but I'd researched about law beforehand. So to come in and actually see how that works in practice was a, a huge help and I sat in employment and restructuring and insolvency at Hogan Levels but they also put on a lot of different talks so you could speak to people from um, finance groups, uh, other, other corporate um, department, energy as well, and you were really able to f work out how each different um, different department worked. And there were obviously a lot of areas where they were quite similar, um, driven by normal business need. But it was also really interesting to see how they were all very, very different in their own way, and to see how they all worked together, obviously, but to see how, even though it's one overarching firm, um, each department is very, very different, and how your career can be so vastly different depending on where you sit, even within the same firm. Thank you. Now congratulations are in order because you've both secured training contracts, which yeah. is excellent. Thank you. Um, so I just want to find out how did your vacation scheme experience help you choose the right firm for you, for your training contract, and how do you think it's going to help you when you start your new, sorry, your new role? Great. Um, so I think doing a vacation scheme really helped me because I understood um, what are the different practice areas involved, uh, what are the clients that the law firms are working with, and most importantly, it kind of gave me an idea of, uh, you know, how sort of how international I wanted my work to be. For example, I really wanted to work on cross-border deals, so I was looking for more international firms versus uh, smaller, more niche law firms. Uh, and I understood a lot better about, as Manesh was saying before, to really dif differentiate a firm. So I looked into things like uh, who are the law firm's clients, where do they have their offices, what are their strategies, uh, what are their visions, um, and most importantly, what is the culture of the law firm like? And I think that when I was making my training contract applications, I was able to really differentiate the law firm from, their, from other law firms, essentially. And I think it also helped me understand me as a person and how I could sell myself. So my skills, for example, uh, the things I learned from my extracurricular activities, my life experiences, I was able to put that in, a, in the application so that the law firm could see that I was somebody they would find interesting and they would bring me for an interview. And what about yourself, Jonathan? Um, I, I think after my doing my, my fair application scheme at Hogan Levels, my commercial awareness really, really improved. And commercial awareness is one of those phrases that you know people always say you can't put a singular academic def definition of it and it's not easy to pin down. I think that's because it's hard to understand it if you haven't actually been in one of those um, firms, even if it's just for two weeks, really seeing how deals actually work. And it's a lot more impressive on forms for future vacation schemes or for training contracts. If you can um, say, I have actually sort of spoken to um, someone who's actually worked on these deals, they've explained to me how it goes through, I've tried out um, how you might go through this process yourself and just be able to explain that from what you've learned at the firm rather than just theory from what you've um, what you've maybe picked up speaking to, to people at, at events that only last a few hours or online which is helpful but you need that other um, practical sort of side of it as well and um, in terms of the fact that I was exposed to so many different areas of law as well 
it really helped me to decide to, to think of films, not just of how large they are or um, what if they were magic circle or not, but also what areas they actually um, really excelled in. And that helped me um, get a training contract at Reed Smith because I wouldn't necessarily have looked at it before, but it, I then found that it was uh, leading in the areas that I really was interested in working in. Brilliant. And now when we were talking earlier about applying to vacation schemes, Risha, you said that there was a couple of things you might have changed on your applications. Can you tell everyone what those would be? So, so the first thing that I would have changed is I would have definitely made my application more personal. For example, if you're a member of a sports club or if you're a part of the Law Society Committee, I would explain to them, I would pick up a story and I'd really explain to the recruiter, for example, um, how I planned out an event. For example, I was one of the events officer for the Law Society and I explained to them how I had organized the event, I explained the hurdles I'd faced, so I think that kind of described how I could also deal with obstacles and rather than just not showing myself in a positive life constantly. I think it also shows how you evolve as a person when you have to deal with stress or you're dealing with time management issues. So make your application more personal. I think my second tip, as I mentioned before, is talk about the law firm you know if there's a deal that you found interesting talk about why that deal is interesting for you and I think two things come out of it a you're showing the fact that you're really interested in the firm because you've seen what kind of clients that they're working with and I think B it brings out your commercial knowledge so that you understand the market events and how that affects the law firms the kind of um, work that the clients mandate the law firms to do so I think it really shows that you're interested in the career and I think last tip I think would be to relax, as Vinesh said, do not write 20 applications and make them the same. Uh, make it personal. If you write really good eight applications, I can guarantee like at least you'll get half of those interview stage so you go forward. And also, uh, this is just a side note, um, if most of the applications nowadays have a lot of um, verbal reasoning tests, so make sure you're practicing them. If you're good from the beginning, that's great, but just because you're a little bit weaker doesn't mean you're not going to go through that hurdle. The key is to keep practicing and I promise you, you'll just get better, at, better with time. Brilliant, I hope you're making note of all of those. And Jonathan, what are your tips for everyone who are watching, um, sort of three top tips for success in applying to a back scheme? Yeah, I'd say um, make sure you uh, make sure that you do a small enough number that you can do all in really good detail. So I'm not going to put a number on it because some people can do um, different numbers of application forms in great detail. So I was able to do 20 or so because I was able to use that the time to really write in very detailed ways why I wanted to um, work for those firms. Some people it could be less, some places it could be more, but make sure that you're not just sending out identical um, applications or very similar. And one test a lot of recruiters have said to me is if, if they can take the name of their firm out and replace it with another firm and it still makes sense, it's not specific enough. You really need to be talking about why you want to work for that firm. And that sort of brings me on to my second point, which is make sure you do a lot of research um, beforehand. And some firms, that, like with, with Reed Smith, they will test you a lot on your application form. They will have large, uh, long questions you to do a lot of research on about the firm. Others, like coping levels, would be less so. There'll be a handful of questions. But even so, when you get to interview, you'll still be expected to talk about why you want to work there. And if you can talk about what areas the firm is really good for, um, maybe some deals some of its partners have done recently, why you'd want to work there, even if it's maybe some charitable initiatives that they're doing that you want to get involved in. It. That's That really shows that you've thought about actually applying to them as a firm rather than just applying to be a lawyer. And I'd say, um, as my final tip, make sure that you're really uh, putting down everything that, that you can do and everything you're good at. And don't don't worry about if you put down too much, then you'll be judged for being you know, boasting too much or anything like that. Um, you're in a very competitive process with people who are going to also have loads of really good extracurricular things and good grades. So you need to show why you're really the best. And it's not arrogant to be able to put down why you're really you're, you're going to be the best for that job. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So that ends the beginning of our webinar. Thank you for all of your fantastic advice and top tips. And we're now going to go to our Q&A session. So I see you've all been busy sending in questions throughout. Um, and please keep sending them in as well. So let me go to my tablet and see where we will begin. So first of all, this is from Ayat. I have no idea what to include in a cover letter. How do I make myself stand out? 
the national video to you first is that you're hiring at the moment yeah no absolutely i mean there are only well, some of the firms i think require a cover letter within the context of the application as well um if i remember rightly um i think that one of the most important things about a cover letter is just the structure of it um we'll come on to the substance in a second but it, it, the second I look at a cover letter, I'd want to see that it shows some thought in terms of the structure of it, that it's been thought out properly, that that person's written it, looked at it again, rewritten it, uh, and gone to gone to the town on it, really, and, and made sure that it all flows very logically. Put yourself in the context of a client, because that's what we have to do every day as solicitors. I have to draft a letter, which a client is going to read and maybe send out to an opposing side or to someone else as part of the deal, they want to know that their solicitor has written a letter that flows well and has a logical structure. So start in the application process. Um, in terms of substance, I think the first thing to say is be guided by what the, the law firm has said. If they have said, write a cover letter which explains your reasons for wanting to join the firm, then make sure your cover letter sticks very closely to that remit. Uh, and don't be afraid to say explicitly, there are five reasons why I want to join this law firm uh, and get straight to it. It's not, uh, it's not your ability to uh, wow with entertaining language and, and write a piece of literature. Uh, you're writing a persuasive case as to why you should be allowed to join that firm. So make it as persuasive and, and to the point as possible. So you don't need flowery language everywhere. You just need to pack it with evidence in a, in a very clear, logical order uh, as to why you want to join that firm. They might ask you to include other things in the cover letter. Uh, if so, make sure you stick very closely to the remit and don't miss out any bits that the law firm wants to see in the cover letter. Right, our next question is from Hayat. Should we consider the top firms if our first year grades are not great? Um, I think she, he or she got a 2-2. Two, two. What do you guys think? Farisha? I think this is a tricky one because I was in a similar situation. Um, not, I didn't necessarily have a 2-2, but I personally didn't feel that my grades were good, good enough for some law firms that I was thinking of applying to. But um, I think it, it can go both ways, but for, from my experience, um, I think my, my grades did not have that much of an effect that I made itself, that I, that I thought it would have. I have a training contract with Allen & Overy, and I remember with my first year grades, I didn't think I, I, my grades were good enough but well there you go like I think it, sometimes it's just in your head so just just give it a try there's there's no loss in trying out brilliant and um, Sophie actually asked a similar sort of question so what can you do to make up for and improve your application if you got um, a high 2-2 in your first year in law degree so Jonathan I'd love to you what you know what can Sophie do um, well I mean I personally got um, a 2-1 in all of my years so this isn't sort of from personal experience but I do know people who have been in a similar situation. And I think if you have any mitigating circumstances, it is really important to, to put those down. Um, firms won't accept anything for mitigating circumstances, but if it's something really important, like you had a hospital appointment, you had an illness at the time, um, and that affected your work, that's, that's something to consider. If that's not sort of um, the case, really focus on, in your, um, subsequent years of university, scoring higher than otherwise you would you want to do, so really put the work in there to show, um, okay, I, I might have not been, um, not might not have achieved as, as much in my first year, but in my second year I can achieve um, this and sort of have the grades to be able to show it as well, that it's not that you're always going to be getting those marks, it's that and if, if you have determination you can then score higher. And also, if you were to get involved in more extracurricular activities, positions of responsibility, those kind of things in the long term are going to be more important than it, what percentage exactly you happen to get on your degree. Um, so if you've got a lot of those, um, or a few that had a lot of responsibility, I think that would, would really help. It would show you you had a broad skill set. Brilliant, thank you. Sophie, I hope that answers the question. We're still receiving more questions. Do send them in. We've got some more time in our webinar, so don't be shy. Get those questions stuck in and we'll put them to the panel. So up next, we've got Emily's question. What qualities are law firms looking for in case study interviews and exercises? Minesh, I'm going to mm. go to you again. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, they're probably similar qualities that the firm is looking for overall, and I think the case study is just one other way to tease out a certain range of those qualities. Um, 
for me, if I was setting a case study and then asking questions on it, I mean, let's say you've got a typical commercial scenario, um, you're given uh, half a page of information about a deal or a dispute, uh, potentially some contractual clauses, and then you're asked various questions in the context of an interview. I think first and foremost, um, law firms are looking for bright individuals. So if you're able to look at those contractual clauses um, and, and work out exactly what the question is asking, let's say it's clauses relating to how to calculate a notice period in a contract, for example. Um, it'll be the basics. Getting that right will show that you're bright, you're able to look at those clauses and answer a question on what they mean. Um, second, and I think it's a quality that is often overlooked by people, um, is just common sense. Uh, and actually, a lot of law firms use the phrase um, commercial awareness, and I know Jonathan spoke about that earlier, and it's quite an enigmatic term. It's very difficult to know what it means. But for me, common sense is a big part of it. If you've got information regarding a deal which is part of a commercial scenario sometimes you're just going to have to take a step back put yourselves in the shoes of one of those parties uh, and answer questions to the best of your ability based on your common sense i mean take a typical dispute sometimes you just need to take a step back and advise a party well you're going to lose a lot of money or you're not going to do this you're going to do that sometimes it's just about common sense and don't be afraid just to rely on your instincts like that so i think a lot of these commercial scenarios are also seeing how well you look at the bigger picture uh, and how much commercial awareness slash common sense you're able to put into that situation. Um, and I think thirdly, an important part of it is attention to detail as well. Um, that is one of the biggest traits uh, that a lawyer needs really. I mean, you need to be ex able to exercise attention to detail in everything you look at. And it's actually one of the biggest weaknesses of trainees coming through the system and the, and the thing that they improve most quickly throughout their training contract. So again, it's about getting into the zone when you're faced with a, with a commercial case study, uh, making sure you digest all the information given to you uh, and making sure that you don't miss anything when, uh, when speaking about it. So Radina and Jemima ask a similar question about uh, preparing for case study and assessment days. Is there anything that you'd like to add to Minesh's answer? I think it's really important to use your time well. I think most law firms would give you uh, 40 to 50 minutes to prepare and I think in that time it's really important to not waste a lot of time going through everything in detail it's quite important to sometimes just skim over and go to the end because you might get a twist at the end of your case study as well so it's really important to finish reading the document and then I think the most important thing is to structure it because usually it's a 10 minute presentation to a senior associate or a partner and I think in your head you need to understand that you're presenting to somebody and you, you want to be concise and you also want to get the main points out. So how I would do it is, for example, if it's um, a deal, for example, I would discuss the solutions. I would also discuss which different uh, areas of the law or the different practice areas that might be involved. And then I would uh, go through um, go through the solutions quite clearly. And I think, as Manesh was saying, sometimes you might get curveball questions. And I think what they're looking for is really common sense. Sometimes you'll get a question where there is no way you're going to know the answer because maybe it's a legislation you've never heard of. But I think it's important to just think about the legislation, even the name, and see what it might relate to. Brilliant. Uh, next one's from Eleanor. So Eleanor's currently on her year abroad studying law in, law in French in France. How would you suggest selling this in an application? Mm. Um, I would say if you're sort of doing a foreign language, foreign languages tend to be for very much sought after in, in, in law firms because um, they're able to be used in cross-border deals, which is something most, if not all firms, are going to be, um, get, going to really be focusing on. So I would definitely sell that, and if they're not already really proficient in it, sort of focus on gaining a greater fluency in that language so that they can actually um, demonstrate their skills the opportunity arises because there's nothing worse than I know some people who've sort of said that they can speak a language better than they can and then they aren't able to do so so really make sure that um, that, that, that language goes up to scratch and also the fact that you've chosen to take a year abroad shows that you're really willing to immerse yourself in a new culture and learn how to speak to people um, across national borders and that's something really valued as well because the largest firms now are really international and they'll have people working there from, from all, all different countries and again they'll be working on deals across nations so the ability to speak to people um, across borders and to just instinctively relate to them is something that you can build up through more exposure so definitely talk about how you've chosen to take that leap into the unknown and how it's going to pay off. 
I think just to, sorry, just to add to that, I, I think Jonathan's second point is is absolutely right. I think um, in terms of the languages side, I mean, I, I speak French and did a year abroad in France, but I don't use French in my day-to-day -day job. I mean, we have a Paris office. Uh, a lot of the firms you'll be applying to will have Paris offices. Uh, most queries in French will go to the Paris office. Um, but I think what Jonathan said second, the, the point about having jumped in at the deep end and being in an unfamiliar environment uh, and having to survive and probably having some tough times while you're out there as well as some really good times um, is definitely life experience that you should sell uh, and, and build upon. And also, if you're in France at the moment, use it as a chance to go meet some law firms in France. Um, it's very difficult to try and get an in with a law firm based in London that has you know, a huge office and very formal schemes. If you're in Paris, where there may be smaller English offices, why not just drop them an email and see if you could spend a day with them or a bit of time with them? I, um, as I said earlier, I paralegaled in, in Paris with Herbert Smith and that all came out of dropping them an email saying, I'm coming to Paris, can I come and see you? And then the next thing I know, I'm working there for a year. Right, we've now got two questions from a man. I love that. If you've got more than one question, send them in. We'll take as many as you send us. So, Aman's first question, which seat are you looking forward to in your training contract and why, Felicia? Well, that's, it's always really important to have a sort of, keep your mind open about where you want to be sitting in. Uh, I think uh, for me personally, I'm quite looking to, um, work with uh, the finance practice area because um, I chose ANO because I have a fantastic reputation with uh, banking and finance. So I definitely want to explore that. So I'm really excited about that. What about you, Jonathan? Um, I, again, I'd say you can never be sure of what seat you're going to get, and especially at Reed Smith, where um, your, your preference in the fourth seat is um, taken into account a lot more than your first seat. So you're probably if you really go in with it aiming for one seat, you're probably going to be disappointed on your first go. But I really want to sit in the media entertainment seat. I spent a week there during my um, vacation scheme at Reed Smith. It's one of sort of Reed Smith's um, main areas of expertise. And I really, really loved the work there because you get to work on, it can be some um, deals around TV shows um, with BBC and ITV. It could be um, dealing with... Um, publishing as well and I really liked creative industries like that so to be able to work on the legal side of it was just a lot of my interest combined into one. And Aman's second question, could you walk him through a transaction and tell me what you enjoyed about it? I open that to the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I can guide you through a, a dispute <laughs> rather than a transaction, if, if, that's, uh, if that's of any use, because that's what I do. That's my bread and butter. Uh, I guess my day-to-day -day job, which might be fairly interesting for you to know, I hope, um, in, in a dispute resolution department, you will have anything between two and four or five long-running cases, the ones that have basically hit legal proceedings formally, so either in court or arbitration. Um, so you'd be working on those. I am just about coming to the end of one of the longest cases I've ever worked on, which is three years uh, and still going, and we're about to come to a judgment. So you'll hit sort of peaks and troughs uh, in the course of a year on a particular long running case. There'll be a, a big deadline for a big submission due where you're writing arguments, uh, which you file to the other side. Um, so it'll be very busy then. Uh, and then there'll be troughs where you're waiting for the other side to come back with an argument as well. Um, that's one thing I like about being in, in dispute resolutions because you sort of have some foresight over the next few months about where your deadlines lie. That's not to say it's not busy. Um, you also have a lot of discreet advice to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so dispute resolution lawyers will often advise their, their non-contentious colleagues. So one of my colleagues came in about 3.30 today to ask me about uh, a contractual clause relating to pure economic loss in tort. So I was going back to my, uh, back to my Clark and Linsell, if, if any of you use that. Uh, so I do use law on a daily basis. Um, and I think just to come back to your question about transactions, um, obviously I don't do that on a day-to-day -day basis. I can't tell you much about the structure of a, of a transaction and that will very much depend on, on what type of non-contentious department you're in. A, a banking or a securities transaction will be very different to a typical M&A transaction. Um, but they tend to be, um, well, in a lot of cases, short and snappy. So you'll get a, a big deal coming in, you'll work towards a closing and it'll be very busy towards a closing and then you'll have a lull and then you'll have another deal coming along and they can be done between anything and one month and a few months. So we've slightly covered this already, but Sophie's asked if you can give an example of how you talk about a recent deal that interested you on an application. She says, I'm not sure what to include and how much of a summary of the case is needed. 
Okay, so um, I'll, I'll sort of, because I've written about some deals in my applications, what I do is uh, usually um, I go through The Economist or The Financial Times or whichever um, financial newspaper you're using to keep up to date, and I'll pick out an interesting deal. And then I'll check out other sort of um, online media, for example, Lawyer to Be or Legal Week, and then you can see which law firms are acting on the deal. Or sometimes, usually, you'll also know which law firms are uh, on either sides of the transaction. So I'll go through the transaction just a little bit. Don't give out a lot of facts. I think the key point is to analyze why you find the deal interesting. So just talk about what the law firm is doing. Uh, is Are they helping out in the banking aspect or is it an M&A transaction? Um, and then just uh, discuss what, why that particular deal is exciting for you. What was the challenge in that deal? Why was it different from other M&A deals that have been going on in the market? And that's how you did just differentiate yourself. That's how I, do, I did it. Would you like to add anything to that, Jonathan? Yeah, um, just most, of, uh, most application forms will have sort of a question like this about, tell us about a recent deal we've been involved in. And as was said before, I think if you just sort of list facts, it's not really helpful because it shows that you're able to pick up a newspaper and read um, a, an article. It doesn't really show you're able to get to grips with it. What you should really be thinking about is putting down the basic facts of the case um, and then analysing it, as as was said, and also potentially if you can think of a solution, it's mm, probably not going to be sort of the same solution as someone with all the information that they have at their disposal. Um, would make, but the fact that you've sort of taken the initiative to say it, you could do this as long as it makes sense and it holds up, I think that that helps as it shows that you're willing to look for solutions, which is something lawyers um, need to do on a daily basis. Right, so next question is from Ayat again. Um, I find video interviews really impersonal and hard to relate to. Should they be treated differently to interviews that happen in person? I haven't ever had a video interview myself, um, but I do know a lot of my university friends did, and I know that they find it very difficult because there's not actually someone there. They they get asked a question, they have to respond in a in a certain time limit, um, and it's I don't know. It just it, it doesn't feel like they should, they should be the same because you're not actually testing how somebody is with with a real person. My advice would be to keep up like prompt cards because mm. they can obviously just see your face but they can't see the notes that are there. Yeah. So usually these are pretty stock questions you're going to be getting. So just have an idea of why the law firm, why you or when you've demonstrated a certain quality that the law firm is looking for. The key to sort of figuring out what questions you might get asked in the video interview is to just see the grad recruitment website mm. and they'll tell you what key skills they're looking for. So just have some stock answers ready and just keep bullet points and if you get stuck or if you're stammering just look down. There's one there's one word and then you just you know compose yourself and just say it yeah and I would also just say um, if you can get over the, the strangers I suppose of it that you're not actually whether it's someone on the other side, I end of the line or you're recording it you're not actually speaking to someone in the first, in who's sitting there if you can just get over that and appear calm that will really look good on on screen because the chance of, of other people having the same interview will also uh, have the same sort of reservations you do and that will help you stand out. Uh, next we go to Radina. On applications, law firms often ask you to select what grade you expect to achieve upon graduation. Why is this important and what grade is it good to put first or a 2-1? Um, well, I think be truthful. Um, <laughs> if you put a first and then you end up getting a third, I'm, I'm not sure the law firm is <laughs> going to be particularly impressed. Um, so be truthful, but you know, ultimately the law firm just wants to know what, what what you're expecting to get as a grade and obviously they're looking for bright individuals and you know if unfortunately you're not on for a 2-1 or perhaps a 2-2 two two, then um, they might sort of sit you down early on and say well you know you, you need to actually try to, to aim for a higher grade otherwise we might not be able to to interview you further so um, I think be truthful but also you're trying to predict something that might be very difficult to predict so try and be realistic about it as well if you're, if you're doing all right in your degree and you think that you're safely on for a 2-1 go for that um, if you think that you're able to get a uh, first and you're able to aim even higher, then w why not put that down? As long as, as I say, it's not completely unrealistic, then you're not doing anything wrong. So the next question is from Jemima, and she's obviously thinking about applying to Simmons & Simmons. Excellent. She asks, um, you know, what does the future look like for Simmons & Simmons? What opportunities are coming up? You know, why should she be joining Simmons & Simmons? Uh, 
Good question. Um, Simmons is going in various amazing directions, actually, and it's almost that on a daily basis we get emails circulated about the future direction of the firm. Um, and I think a lot of it is based around the sector focus, which I know a lot of firms have, but Simmons seems to embrace it quite strongly, uh, and also the markets which Simmons is targeting. So um, we're pushing strongly into Africa now, um, but also into quite a few other emerging markets. Um, we haven't gone and, and developed so strongly in some jurisdictions. We were fairly late to the party in Singapore um, after a lot of firms had set up there. But for example, we are first into places like Iran. Uh, we've already set up a working group which looks at Iran. Uh, we've got various webinars that lots of clients attend and we were involved in reviewing their first petroleum contract. So Simmons is going places in a few of the emerging markets that we're focusing on uh, and also in the sectors that we're looking at, which if you check out our website, there are, there are five sectors that we're focusing on uh, and it really enables you as a lawyer, irrespective of which department you're working in, to start focusing on an area. So I'm a dispute resolution lawyer, but I focus on energy and infrastructure, which is one of the sectors. Uh, and that enables me to have contact with colleagues all around the world who are also interested in energy and infrastructure, even though they're not dispute resolution lawyers. So Simmons has a really tight network all around the world, uh, and we're building that in, in various places, uh, cautiously, but really strongly. Uh, and actually, it's quite an exciting time for Simmons. I hope that answers your question, Jemima. Uh, next one from Aman. I'm hoping to transition into a legal career from a finance career, but have no legal experience. What advice would you have for me? Well, uh, don't be afraid to do it. I mean, I think it's about 50% of all training contract uh, gr uh, candidates now are from a non-law background. Um, so it's certainly not going to preclude you from doing that. And actually, um, we can come on to talk about the Law Society's recent proposal about, uh, or the SRA's proposal about a, uh, a new qualifying exam. Um, that's a, a whole can of worms which we can go into. Uh, but one of the points of that is probably to focus more on your ability as a potential solicitor rather than, say, your grades in your law degree. Because what we're starting to find now is that, you're, irrespective of your academic background, you have to be able to have the skills to succeed as a solicitor. And if you have a first class degree from a brilliant university, that may not necessarily mean you're going to be a good solicitor. Equally, uh, you may not have gone to one of the top 10 universities, but it turns out that you're a brilliant solicitor. Uh, so the background and, and what you've specialised in previously uh, doesn't really matter because being a solicitor is all about the day-to-day -day skills. So I wouldn't worry at all about the fact that you have a non-law background. Uh, and, in, and in fact, you, you've got a background which is probably something that you need to sell a bit more uh, and say, look, I've got these skills in this area um, and really hone in on where those transferable skills are. What does that mean in terms of what you can bring to the table in a typical law firm environment? So. I'd have a sit down and say, you know, what are your strengths in terms of the, the financial world and what you can bring uh, to the legal world? Just before we move on to the next question, I just want to slip in one of my questions. In our commercial awareness update, which you can find on the Bright Network blog, we were talking about the new super exam that's mm. being put forward for, for solicitors. What do you think about that? Is it good? Is it bad? What does it mean? Uh, am I allowed to say the jury's still out? Yeah, <laughs> you can uh, tell the fence. <laughs> it's, it's, diff it's too early to tell. But it's interesting why it's all come about, and actually it could all happen very quickly. Uh, I mean, law firms will tell you that one of the reasons is because it's tricky recruiting so many years in advance. So, you know, we, we take people on in their second year of university, and sometimes it's not three or four or five years later until they start work in the firm. Uh, and, and so actually that time lag makes it very difficult to know what that person has become and sometimes you know you may have missed out on a good candidate that didn't quite fit the bill in their second year of university but actually has developed into someone who could be a fantastic solicitor so that's one of the issues i think it's trying to address the other is as i said actually now i think solicitors are starting to realize it's all about the day-to-day -day skills uh, of being a good solicitor in terms of your practical abilities and um, it's gone are the days when just because you've got a first class degree from oxbridge means you're going to be a good solicitor that's just not the case anymore so i think there's definitely going to be an emphasis on um, practical skills and actually that's why law firms recruit from their VAC scheme more and more often now is because they get a chance to see how you work on a day-to-day -day basis for two or three weeks and that's very much more important than some numbers on a page in a lot of cases. Don't get me wrong, your academic backgrounds are still very important to tell us how bright you are, but I think the shift is going to be more and more on how well you can cope with what we do on a daily basis. Jonathan, do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, I mean, I haven't actually taken the LPC yet, so I don't know what the LPC is like and whether this exam is going to be better in sort of teaching those skills or not. Um, I do think 
it depends because one of the arguments raised in favour of it at the moment is that uh, the, the LPC tends to cost a lot for people who haven't already got a training contract. In that way, it might be able to help um, increase social mobility, that people will be able to take that exam, it won't cost them as much, they'll be able to prove they're a good solicitor. At the same time, it might be that they still need to go to providers to learn those skills before taking the exam, which might end up charging the same, so you, you don't actually know what's what's going to happen there. Um, I I do think, um, as has been said about sort of day-to-day -day skills and um, things like interpersonal skills and time management and that, that kind of thing are probably more important than the academic side of things. Um, so in principle, I don't have an issue with the new exam, but again, I haven't done the LPC, so I'm not sure what I'd compare it to. Farisha, what do you say? I wouldn't know much, I'm still studying. Yeah. So it's something to find out about yeah, the future. <laughs> Fab. And our next question from Enfo, if an application asks about any further information you'd like to add, do you have to give an extensive answer? Hmm, good question. Um, <laughs> I think my instinct would be don't feel the need to fill out that box unless you think there's something that you need to include. So I think, as Jonathan said earlier, if there are any extenuating circumstances which explain some of your grades, for example, then that might be the place to put it in. Um, but I wouldn't feel the need to fill that out unless there's something that you think they need to see. I mean, just think about it practically. Graduate recruitment, people read hundreds of applications. They don't need to read more unnecessary waffle at the end of your application. And then the final question is from Jeremy. So what is the one thing on your application that will make you help you stand out? If there's anything that you can pick out that will really help you get noticed by the recruiters? I think in terms of the application form specifically, um, I mean, I still think actually it comes back to what I said about knowing the firm. Um, I'm just so impressed when we get candidates who know our firm sometimes better than we do which is absolutely amazing and I wonder where they get the information from but they obviously do and it just really goes to show that you care about the application you're making and you've you've gone into you spent the time to learn about the firm and what it's about and what the culture is about and that just adds credibility to your application in so many ways you know one it shows that you you actually care and you you spent a bit of time looking into it um, and two, it shows that you've carefully thought about probably the information that, that you've seen and you've digested it and thought, well, actually, I do want to apply to this firm knowing all I know about it. Uh, and, and three, it's probably going to make you better once you join the firm in that you've known a bit more about the culture. You're not just sort of jumping in at the deep end. Uh, and I think bringing that out in your application form and in the rest of the application process is, is something that is probably quite crucial, really. I mean, I, as I say, I'm interviewing quite a bit now and it's very, very clear when candidates haven't learnt the firm at all. I mean, there are, you know, there are some howlers. Uh, there really are, <laughs> and people, you know, say things that are applicable to the wrong firm, and you know, it can really let you down. Trisha, what's your final bit of advice for everyone watching today? I think my final bit of uh, advice with applications is, uh, as Manish said, um, do your homework. But I think it's really important to proofread. Sometimes we, we are under so much pressure that your application might just be chucked to the bin just because, you know, for a simple grammatical error. So check your spellings. Make sure the spelling is consistent. If it's English or British spelling, just make sure it's just consistent. Um, make it personal uh, in terms of motivational questions. Um, you know, sh really show and like give a situation and talk about your experiences and um, mention the law firm, you know, why you particularly would be a good fit for the law firm. And Jonathan, you've got the final words today. Yeah. What um, would you say? Again, make sure your spelling and grammar is great. Make sure that you put the name of the right law firm on the application form. Um, I've heard loads of recruiters who said that someone's put, I'd like to work Clifford Chance and it's link laters or, or something like that. And it's something people do without realising. So don't be that person because if that's the first thing they read, that sort of it will colour how they read the rest of the application for even if it's brilliant. And also I'd say coming from university, uh, you're probably used to talking about your academic skills, but really emphasise the transferable skills you have as well. So interpersonal skills, attention to detail, time management, working in groups with people, um, and any sort of practical experience you've had because it's although you need good grades obviously it's those skills that assessors are going to be looking at um, more keenly to really see how you'd be you'd work as a solicitor day to day. 
Brilliant. Well, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for today. For all those questions that we didn't get round to answering, we'll be putting together um, a blog article on the website, so do check that out. And equally, keep sending in your questions, and we'll include those on the blog as well. So send them to hello at brightnetwork.co.uk. Um, we'd also love to hear your feedback. What did you think of the webinar? What did you think of what we were all saying? Um, you know, how could we improve the format? Any sort of feedback that you've got, we'd love to receive it so that we can keep improving and deliver the best content to you that's the most relevant and tailored. Um, so that leaves me to say thank you very much to our panel, to Farisha, Manesh and Jonathan, and thank you to you for watching, and I hope you'll join us again for another webinar soon. Bye. <laughs>